Lynn, thank you. Rafael, thank you. Everyone at the Instituto San Carlos, thank you. All the board of directors and sponsors for KWLS, thank you. Um, Arlo, where are you? Hey, thank you. Um, so, I am to the age I'm realizing now where I actually need glasses to do this, but I'm just realizing this now, so I'm going to squint <laughs> quite a bit. Um, I'm also going to start by reading um, quite a bit. Bear with me for a few minutes. Um, largely what I'm talking about is what I'm always talking about, which is translation. I'm always thinking in terms of translation. I myself am a translation, I'm translating a lot of things to you right now being, as Derek Walcott put it, um, behind the raft of this dais, as he said in Sweden, as he won the, uh, as he accepted the Nobel. Um, writers, first and foremost, are readers. You're asked quite often when you're on the road, uh, what's the most important thing to do as a writer? It's always read. Um, and so I want to start by sharing with you a bit of my reading. Um, and I want to read something old, but in an incredibly new skin, Emily Wilson's translation of The Odyssey. I'm going to start in the middle of book nine. I'm not going to give you any kind of summary. We'll just jump in. Is that all right? Because I've got 50 minutes. <laughs> but I'm not killing time. I'm not. We're in a cave with Odysseus and some of his men. I said I wasn't going to do a summary. We're in a cave with Odysseus and some of his men. They're in a bit of trouble. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Strangers, who are you? Where did you come from across the watery depths? Are you on business? or roaming round without a goal like pirates who risk their lives at sea to bring disaster to other people. So he spoke, his voice so deep and booming, and his giant sighs made our hearts sink in terror. Even so, I answered, we're the Greeks come here from Troy. The winds have swept us off in all directions across the vast expanse of sea off course from our planned route back home. Zeus willed it so. We are proud to be the men of Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, whose fame is greatest under the sky, for sacking the vast city and killing many people. Now we beg you, here at our knees to grant a gift as is the norm for hosts and guests. Please, sir, my lord, respect the gods. We are your suppliants and Zeus is on our side since he takes care of visitors, guest friends, and those in need. Unmoved, he said, well, foreigner, you are a fool, or from some very distant country. You order me to fear the gods. <laughs> My people think nothing of that Zeus with his big scepter, nor any god. Our strength is more than theirs. If I spare you or spare your friends, it will not be out of fear of Zeus. I do the bidding of my own heart. But are you going far in that fine ship of yours or somewhere near? He spoke to test me, but I saw right through him. I know how these things work. I answered him deceitfully. Poseidon, the earth shaker, shipwrecked me at the far end of your island. He pushed us in, wind dashed us on the rocks. We barely 
managed to survive. But he made no reply and showed no mercy. Leaping up high, he reached his hands towards my men, seized two, and knocked them hard against the ground like puppies. And the floor was wet with brains. He ripped them limb from limb to make his meal, then ate them like a lion on the mountains, devouring flesh, entrails, and marrow bones, and leaving nothing. Watching this disaster, we wept and lifted up our hands in prayer to Zeus. We felt so helpless. When the Cyclops had filled his massive belly with the meal of human meat and unmixed milk, he lay stretched out among his flocks. Then thinking like a military man, I thought I should get out my sword. go up to him and thrust right through his torso, feeling for his liver. That would have doomed us all. On second thoughts, I realized we were too weak to move the mighty stone he set in the high doorway. So we stayed there in misery till dawn. Early the dawn appeared, pink fingers blooming and then he lit his fire and milked his ewes in turn and set a lamb by every one. When he had diligently done his chores, he grabbed two men and made a meal of them. After he ate, he drove his fat flock out. He rolled the boulder out and back with ease as one would set the lid upon a quiver. Then, whistling merrily, the Cyclops drove his fat flocks to the mountain. I was left scheming to take revenge on him and hurt him and gain the glory if Athena let me. I made my plan. Beside the pen there stood a great big club, green olive wood, which he had cut to dry to be his walking stick. It was so massive that it looked to us like a ship's mast, a 20 oared black freighter that sails across the vast sea full of cargo. I went and cut from it about a fathom and gave it to the men and ordered them scrape it down. They made it smooth and I stood by and sharpened up the tip and made it hard in the blazing flame. The cave was full of dung. I hid the club beneath a pile. Then I gave orders that the men cast lots for who would lift the stake with me and press it into his eye. When sweet sleep overtook him, the lots fell on the men I would have chosen, four men, and I was fifth among their number. At evening, he drove back his woolly flocks into the spacious cave, both male and female, and left none in the yard outside, perhaps suspecting something or perhaps a god told him to do it. He picked up and placed the stone to form a door and sat to milk the sheep and bleeding goats in turn, then put the little ones to suck. His chores were done. He grabbed two men for dinner. I approached and offered him a cup of ivy wood filled full of wine. I said, here, Cyclops, you have eaten human meat. Now drink some wine. Sample the merchandise our ship contains. I brought it as a holy offering so you might pity me and send me home. But you are in a cruel rage beyond what anyone could bear. Do you expect more guests when you have treated us so rudely? He took and drank the sweet, delicious wine he loved it and demanded more. Another! And now, tell me your name so I can give you a present as my guest, one you will like. My people do have wine. Grape clusters grow from our rich earth, fed well by rain from Zeus. But this whew, is nectar, god food. 
So I gave him another cup of wine and then two more. He drank them all unwisely. With the wine gone to his head, I told him all politeness, Cyclops, you have asked my name. I will reveal it. Then you must give the gift you promised me of hospitality. My name is no man. My family and friends all call me no man. He answered with no pity in his heart. I will eat no man last. First, I will eat the other men. This is my gift to you. Then he collapsed, he fell on his back and lay there, his massive neck askew, all conquering sleep took him. In drunken heaviness, he spewed wine from his throat and chunks of human flesh. And then I drove the spear into the embers to heat it up and told my men, be brave. I wanted none of them to shrink in fear. The fire soon seized the olive spear, green though it was, and terribly it glowed. I quickly snatched it from the fire. My crew stood firm. Some god was breathing courage in us. They took the olive spear, its tip all sharp, and shoved it in his eye. I leaned on top and twisted it as when a man drills wood for shipbuilding. Below, the workers spin the drill with scraps stretched out from either end. So round and round it goes. And so we whirled the fire-sharp weapon in his eye, his blood poured out around the stake and blazing fire sizzled his lids and brows and fried the roots. As when a blacksmith dips in an ax or adds to temper in its ice cold water, loudly it shrieks. From this the iron takes on its power. So did his eyeball crackle on the spear. Horribly then he howled, the rocks resounded, and we shrank back in fear. He tugged the spear out of his eye, all soaked with gushing blood. Desperately with both hands he hurled it from him and shouted to the cyclopes who lived in caves high up on the windy cliffs around. They heard and came from every side and stood near the cave and called out, Polyphemus, what is the matter? Are you badly hurt? Why are you screaming through the holy night and keeping us awake? Is someone stealing your herds or trying to kill you by some trick or force? Strong Polyphemus from inside replied, my friends, no man is killing me by tricks, not force. Their words flew back to him. If no one hurts you, you are all alone. Great Zeus has made you sick, no help for that. Pray to your father, mighty Lord Poseidon. Then off they went, and I laughed to myself at how my name, the No Man Maneuver, tricked him. This. This is a talk um, about words that I don't usually use when I talk about the art of poetry, the art of writing, translation, or even myself, um, identity, autobiography, the self. I who have no weapon but poetry. You see, and really, actually, vibing with you a bit, Raphael, the end when you were talking about the power of the pen, Odysseus always had the power of his tongue, not as strong as Ajax, but mighty in the tongue. He was, in a sense, our first man of words. He represented a change to a different type of power. And what he recognized at that moment, when he's trapped in a cave and seeing a 20-foot-tall cyclops eating his men, that the most powerful thing he had at that moment, his weapon, 
and his tool, it wasn't the stake in the Cyclops' eye. It was becoming no one, no man, namelessness. I find myself thinking about this quite a bit um, because I'm not what you would call an autobiographical writer, at least not on the surface. If you look at my work, you'll find um, that there's lots of uh, gestures to a self, um, lots of personae, lots of people who may or may not be me. I've always believed, as Robert Hayden says, that it's important to switch the gender. I've also kept in mind the way in which Adrian Rich in poems such as Diving into the Wreck found some type of chasm in the gender. Or Elizabeth Bishop's great poems such as Crusoe in England where she's changing the gender. There's some flickering idea of the self that we make ourselves and part of it which we inherit. This is a great gift of the diaspora. It's something in the mutability of the sea uh, and also the skyscapes. It's also something Americans have learned. For instance, if you think about the way in which the blues really has a character, or Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man is a story about someone who has a name, but we don't know what it is. He knows what it is. But the moment that he learns to be other people and not worry about what his name was, it's when he found true power, even if that power was simply to escape. Um, I was betwixt and between reading to you um, a section of the Odyssey or a section of the Iliad. When I think of the Caribbean, I often think of, um, one would think the Odyssey, but I think often of the Iliad because of the shield of Achilles section. There's a moment when Patroclus is killed by Hector and Hector does what he has the right to by custom, take his armor and his weapons. But those weapons and that armor was not Patroclus's, remember, right? They were mighty Achilles. So Achilles lost not only his best friend, but also his weapons, his arms, his shields, his sign of himself. Up until this point, he was um, salty and not fighting, right? He was sitting back in his ships. Everything was going wrong for the Achaeans. At this point, he realized that he needed to enter the fray but he had no weapons, and his mother Thetis went down and found Hephaestus, and Hephaestus made the mighty shield that contained everything from towns and cities, um, fields, the sky, the sea, and all of the constellations. It is something that moves and yet doesn't move. To me, it is an archetypal image of the Caribbean, which in itself, as it is itself, is a thing about constant movement, people moving, the phenomena of the natural world moving. But, Raphael, as you reminded us, when we commodify the Caribbean, it becomes a thing of stasis. Pictures, fixed images that you pass on to others so that they come and visit and meet that image, that still shot that they have of a beach or cliff or the sea. I found myself thinking about this because, um, well, a couple of funny things happened yesterday. One of them was I had lunch with Teju and Aishan, and they were giving me a bit of a hard time because we were talking about writing and what has made us. Who are the people who put us together? I always avoid this question. Who are your influences? Who did you read growing up? I always have always danced around this. Um, and it's because I don't like to be fixed. I don't like to kind of draw out a family tree of my writing in this way. But Teju, as is his want, said, come on, give me something. <laughs> and I gave him something, and I thought that what I would do, since I'm here with you all in such an intimate setting, really one of my favorite places on earth, is to give you what I haven't given before, which is really... Um, a song of the inner self that's not about um, the imagination as I make it, but rather the imagination as it's made me. As I said, I am a translation in a lot of ways that are um, funny and tragic and weird. I listened to Jamaica's um, fantastic talk yesterday and thought about the way in which also 
um, I've spent my life appropriating, as all artists do, because that's what art really is. Um, and so I'd like to begin this with an admission of that, and kind of a strange song of myself. It's going to include parts of poems that I've written. I realize that as they start to interweave themselves into this narrative, um, you'll see perhaps where these poems first came from and why they came uh, to be. So without further ado, I don't know if this is shield or sword. I don't know if this is weapon or tool. But this is I who have no weapon but poetry. As writers, we're in the process of creating a single art. I should have taken this sip before I started. I'm reminded of Elizabeth Bishop, who lived nearby on 624 White Street, and her one art where she compelled herself to write it at the end. And as is the case with all lyric poems, compelling herself is really compelling all of us. We are all saying what Elizabeth Bishop was saying and writing. Write it. We're in the process of creating a single art, one art, some trace of what we were able to accomplish with our language before we inevitably cancel each other out. Eventually, our writing will become a cloudy thing, a mere indication that we lived and felt compelled to make art with our grammar and our syntax, like a mood in the musical or painterly sense of it, a mood of what we made an excavation of words that would be found by others in a post-word world. All of our writing in mass will point back to ourselves as one mass, the forensic indication of a civilization, a nugget cragged deep inside the mountain of the mess here that we've made and are making. Therefore, allow me to pick up where Jamaica left off last night, for this, too, is a story of appropriation. Jamaica, I am appropriating you. <laughs> I have appropriated you all my life. I was appropriating you even before I was born. Derek, rest in peace. I have been appropriating you. Kaz, don't get mad, but I've been appropriating you. So many of you, I've been appropriating you. I have been late, so late to make sense of it, belated to all of it. Appropriation is at times an intent. Appropriation at times is an inheritance. I've spent my life far more invested in how the self makes itself than in how the self has been made. Today I'll talk for a bit about how my self has been made. My parents were both born in Antigua in the same year as Jamaica. My father in March, my mother in August. That would put Jamaica's May birthday in the middle. My mother is from St. John's and went to Hill School. My father is from Potter's and went to Pilgrim High. His sisters went to Princess Margaret. They weren't originally from Potter's, my father's family. They were from Freeman's and moved to Potter's to be closer to the city. My mother to this day speaks of my father as a country bumpkin and herself as a city girl. This despite Potter's and St. John's being but a few minutes away from each other. Ladies and gentlemen, Antigua, it's a small place. <laughs> At some point, in a particular fit of 70s restlessness, my parents, for some reason, decided to move to New York. I'm still a little bitter about this, by the way. <laughs> a number of my family's relatives had already made the move there. And my parents, comfortable, 
were curious. So they finally made the move as well. My mother was at that time eight months pregnant. I was born in Harlem Hospital in November at 11.59 at night. I was named after my father, who was named after both Rowan Henry, a prominent lawyer on the island, and a voice of the political opposition of the time who was murdered under rather strange circumstances. And the great Guyanese Indian cricketer, Rowan Kanai. But I was immediately and irreducibly a New Yorker, born in the cold, across the street from the Schomburg. This was the tactile beginning of myself. In the beginning was this surface, a wall, a beginning. Tonight it coaxed music from a Harlem cloud bank. It freestyled the smoke from a stranger's coat. It stole thinned gin. It was at the edge of its beginnings, but outside looking in. The lapsed blue facade of Harlem Hospital is weather still, like a starlit lake in the midst of Lenox Avenue. Tonight I touched the tattooed skin of the building I was born in. And because tonight is curing, the beginning let me through. And everywhere was blurring halogen. Love the place that welcomed you. And I do, but this love feels random, an invention. Like how Ralph Ellison, citing Heraclitus as having said that geography is fate, was an invention. Heraclitus never said that. But it sounds too good not to be true. But then I remember that Jonathan Galassi was born in Seattle, and no one seems less Seattle than Jonathan Galassi. But still, geography, is it fate? I love where I'm from, but like I said, that love feels random. And as I am made of love, I too feel random. If my relatives had moved from Antigua to Toronto, I would simply be Canadian. Pardon me when I say simply, Andre. I know it's much more complicated than that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Still with the same language, right? The same bridge between their accents and my lack of one, or my accent and their lack of one. New York was no metropole for Antigua. It was a British colony until 1981. But when I asked my parents why they didn't move to London, which to my naive ass seemed to make sense, <laughs> wouldn't, they, wouldn't that have been a more on the nose move? They told me that Antiguans who moved to New York would send back letters home that had money in them. And Antiguans who moved to London would send letters back home asking for money. <laughs> and that was it. The winter trees shine white in the white sun, daydreaming of West Indian dawn, of palms that line the brick back of a beach, the mazy green hem of a paradise my parents knew as home or here, conceived me to think their hearth for, far off from the Yankee blood in my heart because geography is fate and here is mine. The winter, the nude trees like splintered spears souvenir to earth by the fallen in the promise of coo -coo 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 -coo. And eventually, again, the stirring bloom and the evergreens down the dirt road, all one up the mountain path toward the sun. So I grew up in a house that was Antiguan, constantly visiting my Antiguan relatives, and going to church at the United Moravian Church on 127th Street and 3rd Avenue. Somehow the Moravian denomination had a strong presence in Antigua. And just about every Antiguan in New York seemed to go to this one church. 
If they lived in Brooklyn, they would go to that church. If they lived in Queens, they would go to that church. If they lived in the Bronx, they would go to that church. No Antiguans live in Staten Island, but if they did, they would have gone to that church. The services were pretty much high Anglican. I'm still not sure what Moravian has to do with it. Also, this is where my sense of my family tree went up in flames because everyone was auntie this or cousin that, granny who, da da this. To this day, a casual conversation with my family can at any point lead to the discovery that a person I spent my life thinking I was related to was actually not related to me at all. The leaves fall from the tree, but the tree is still there. Anyway, being basically a high Anglican church, the Wesleyan hymns were nonstop. At a funeral, we would all rise and sing, it is well with my soul. I still have the memory from my childhood of my parents, both excellent singers, belting this in harmony as I stood waist high between them. My father's baritone like a swath of suede being brushed to show its darker side. And then my mother's mezzo soprano sweeping back against the suede to reveal its lighter side. Back and forth, back and forth, it went and it was well with my soul. My parents, after a childhood of being dragged to church, now as secular as a Saturday night in Vegas, singing of the soul like Catholics, surrounded by a sea of other Antiguans, people they grew up with across the ocean, now in a church in Harlem. It turns out that this didn't happen. I found this out two, maybe three years ago. One of the foundational memories of my life did not happen, or at least not in this way. Maybe they didn't harmonize. According to my father, my mother's a terrible singer, <laughs> which when I thought about it is kind of true. I wouldn't say she's a terrible singer, but she's just not going to harmonize with someone. I mean, even if she could, knowing my mother, she wouldn't have any time for that. <laughs> or maybe my father wasn't there. As a child in Potters, he had to go to church four days a week, often twice in the same day. He hasn't made much of an effort to go to church since then, besides which he hates crowds. But even as I write this, the memory is intact. I kid you not, I remember this. And herein lies the problem. My mind has always been ahead of me. I wouldn't go as far as to say that I love to make things up, because I don't. I wasn't trying to make anything up. It's just that the stories happen. With me, they've always happened. And they've always been rhythmic. They've always been mythic. They've always, now that I think about it, sought to salve something that I didn't know was hurting. And this is so because I am and have always been belated. I'm a New Yorker. I barely feel American. I don't feel that these two things contradict each other. I grew up in an Antiguan house, ate Antiguan food, made the mistake of getting my father a Mighty Sparrow album once for his birthday, only to have him tell me that Sparrow sucks and why didn't I get him a King Short Shirt album? <laughs> but people who looked like me, who weren't related to me, weren't Antiguan. Correction, I knew plenty of people who looked like me and weren't related to me at the United Moravian Church, but I thought they were related to me. These people were from everywhere else. In school, when we would read books by black authors, there would inevitably be the church moment where something churchy would happen. All that would be missing would be a neon flashing light saying AME, or church moment in capital letters, that would hurdle you back to the American South via gospel. And I would feel like that was interesting, but that I was reading something that was so far from what I had going on. The weirdest moments would be when the teacher would call on me, because it was the 80s and teachers were still calling the black kid to authenticate a black moment. And I would look at my teacher like she was fucking crazy. 
look, I have no idea, okay? I mean, yeah, I get it, but I don't have much to add from an existential point of view. If you want to get some Elliot or Dunn out, then maybe we can talk because the Moravians up in Harlem are rolling high, high in the high Anglican stuff, sorry. <laughs> and that was the end of that. And then there are the Jamaicans. I somehow ended up with what linguists have told me is a completely neutral American accent, so perfect in its flatness that it can't be taught. This, coupled with my name, leads people to not have any freaking idea where I'm from. <laughs> However, once a hint of the Caribbean has been figured out, maybe they hear my folks or I say something, then, like everyone from the English-speaking Caribbean who's not from Jamaica, immediately, I'm from Jamaica. <laughs> I consider this akin to living in New York now and telling people that you're a writer and them, of course, assuming that you live in Brooklyn. <laughs> Jamaica has always loomed so large, large like the Greater Antilles. It's large. Marley's shadow is large. No one ever hears a Caribbean accent and asks, oh, are you from Antigua? <laughs> this then is the story of how my blackness places me constantly where I'm not from, always placed me constantly where I wasn't from, and my passport placed me where I wasn't from, because let's face it, and it's not just now, New York and the majority of the rest of the country are the same country barely you'll find more laws in common between two different Western European countries than between New York City and Baton Rouge. There was an Antiguan I grasped onto, though, when I was young. SD Special Delivery Jones. He was a wrestler in the WWF. He wasn't a star. He wasn't a mug. But when I'd hear his introduction and his opponent from the island of Antigua. I don't know, it wasn't about representation, I just liked hearing someone sing it. From the island of Antigua. You don't say that in real life, you know? Where are you from? I'm from the island of Antigua. <laughs> no. There was no drama behind it, it was a fact. Except, it wasn't a fact for me. Technically, I wasn't from Antigua. My father, if he were editing this, would cross out technically. My mother, who's perfected a style of objection in which it sounds like she's going to be terse, and then suddenly monologues with great philosophic vigor and borderline, not really borderline contempt, would rev up for a response to me saying, I'm Antiguan, with three words. Give me a break. I know those are four words. <laughs> and then on and on my parents would go or the state of me not being Antiguan, talking at the same time, and yes, wait for it, harmonizing. <laughs> and yet they have never ever called me American. And they've gone to great strides to remind me constantly that I'm not African-American, which, by the way, I already knew because of the church sermon thing I kept running into in Du Bois, Hughes, Hurston, Baldwin, and on. But what am I then? They'd say, as they always say, I was born in New York. I love New York, but New York is not a nation. It was around this time when everything caved in around me as far as what I am is concerned few lines of poetry. These aren't mine, but you'll know who they're from. I had no nation but the imagination. I'm either nobody or I'm a nation. Next we pass slave ships, flags of all nations, our fathers below deck too deep, I suppose to hear us shouting. So we stopped shouting. I started reading Derek Walcott. There are three aspects of Walcott's work that immediately made sense to me. One, his sense of exile 
as an existential metaphor. Two, his imagination being innately pictorial. And three, his devotion to sound as an idea. Put these three acts, aspects together and you have a displaced person intensely seeing, listening, and being literal about it, which ironically is where metaphor really comes from, from being really, really literal until literal breaks. Many of us here are going to talk about Derek, so I'll keep this really brief and simply add that Derek's work gave me a model, especially in Shabin, for being both from a region and exiled from it, and seeking reconciliation in the ut pictura poesis of the imagination, like poetry is painting. I appropriated from that what, as Stevens put it, was the poem of the mind in the act of finding that which will suffice. New York, I realized, was always going to be in my Caribbean. That Kirk collection of islands would have to do. From here, I started making sense of my vocation, which was always poetry. How are we on time? Oh, we're good. But first, the question, because now we're going to start talking more kind of specifically about writing. When did you know you wanted to become a poet? No one believes this question. No one listens for the answer. It's one of those habits of people forced to live together on a spinning rock. The pale blue dot a wince in the wide attention the dying light seeks out from ice giants dull and firm in the dark. Under polite lights, midst rows and rows of people who ask when and why about poetry. Of she who forgets to ask something that was, I realized later part of the poem, the part where it all comes together and having come together finally sings. I never mind when it comes, and it always comes, but I don't mind it. How did you become a writer? Or when did you know you wanted to be a writer? Or did you always know you wanted to be a writer? Something like that. Where does this question come from? Why is it ubiquitous? And what is its purpose and function? Iris wants to be a writer and does the right thing. She devours books. Many of the authors she reads are dead. She reads their biographies, and no matter how much they sanctify or savage their subject, there is a barrier. Some of the authors that she reads are still living. She reads their interviews, maybe a memoir or two. She reads an autobiography and wonders why it isn't a memoir. She reads a memoir and wonders why it isn't an autobiography. And no, no matter how much they clarify or cauterize their subject, the, there is a barrier. Of course there is a barrier. This barrier is as unsurmountable as the gate that closed on the Garden of Paradise. It is unscalable and endless. Deep in her heart, Iris knows this. But when she finally has the chance to ask a writer anything, face to face, she asks this. How did you become a writer? How did you become a writer? When did you know you wanted to be a writer? Did you always know you wanted to be a writer? Something like that. And the writer answers, I read a magic book and it influenced me so much when I opened it, flames shot out from the pages. The spine smelled like lilac, honeysuckle, ginger root, and thyme. It taught me the four ways of the procrastinating tiger and told me to climb the Mara Mountains. All of that happened and I became a writer. Something like that. Iris is half listening. She's never seen a single flame from a single page of a single book she's read. She is enacting the role of the listener, the writer, the role of the writer. These are theatrical distances from the truth. The truth being that fiction spurs the question and the answer. We are all born telling stories set to rhythm and rhymes, it is how we first understand the world. 
what we perceive and conceive is melodic truth. Then we reach a certain age where it is socialized out of us. You stop saying how your day is going through song. You stop explaining that you love lasagna because you love lasagna through song. That's weird. You want to have friends. <laughs> or simply not get beat up. So you turn the tap off. Sometimes it's too late to turn it back on. Sometimes. Sometimes you turn it off at 12. Sometimes you turn it off at 33. I never turned my tap off. I always read and wrote poetry. And if someone wanted to fight me, then we were going to fight. And that was that. I was on a journey. I needed to make sense of it somehow. And there was no mirror. Everything felt like I came after it. This included not only being Antiguan, but my own name. My parents never called me Rowan. I'm Ricky from Ricardo, but not Ricky Ricardo. <laughs> I'm also the first Phillips in my family. My mother decided Philip, my father's family name, sounded too much like a first name, in America at least. Rowan Philip would lead inevitably to Philip Rowan. That was her story, and she's sticking to it. For the record, that's an Old Norse first name, a Spanish middle name, and one of those faux English, faux Dutch sounding last names that's really Greek. For lover of horses. Rowan Ricardo Phillips. Another of those names that straddles seas in the sails of unseen ships. Still, it sounds typically West Indian to me. And like the West Indies, indefinite. An indefinite noun in an indefinite poem. And it took me a while to accept it. So it turns out I'm not even really a Phillips. That it's an invention at the whim of my mother. And this is still a touchy subject among the Philip clan, especially the aforementioned aunts who went to Princess Margaret. Years later, I would meet Cass Phillips, and he would tell me that he, too, is a Philip turned into a Phillips. So I don't even have that to myself. And of course, he, too, is from an island so small, it sometimes appears on a map, and sometimes, and he, too, loves soccer or football or soccer, depending on who he's talking to, and too much, and tennis just enough, and has his inherited city. This is the part where I should say that I was heartened, that I wasn't the only one, that I wasn't alone, but this would be untrue. I was, again, belated. But by this point, I had learned to love it. What moved me more, much more, than having someone with whom I shared an experience was the fact that I had learned to cull the power and poignancy of being belated, being the second or third, a layer and just a layer in the palimpsest. After all, don't we fetishize firstness? And isn't it poison for the poet? Have we not killed Phyllis Wheatley's poetry with firstness, so eager to say that she was the first X, Y, Z, that the poems become an afterthought? And when Milton writes in Paradise Lost that he is doing things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme, he's actually doing what Tasso did. And when was the last time you read Jerusalem Liberata? Poetry is belated experience, represented as immediate experience. It is music for when the music is over. And then there is Jamaica. Life's concentric circles span from the self and yet are alien to the self. The torque of gravity from having been here, whatever here is, whatever this is, pushes against reality, altering its shape. We are tossed as rocks into the black water of the cosmos, blind to our beginnings. At some point, we go from being the rock entering the water to the rock being submerged 
to rising on the other side of our lives, looking at the rock entering the water. I can't tell you when I wanted to be a writer because I have always written, which is different from being a writer. I like to forget sometimes that I'm a writer. Honestly, I never like to remember that I'm a writer. I prefer just to write. But I remember reading Jamaica for the first time and then the second time, once in school and then right after, outside of school, and thinking about being a writer for the first time. Jamaica spoke to you about the difference between seeking freedom and seeking happiness. After all I've told you about Antigua, I knew from early on that Antigua had its great writer. I felt a great freedom and a great happiness. As random as the pieces that have made my life were, Derek, Kaz, and Jamaica threw me the hell out of the crib. They had those pieces covered and I began to write about other things, deep space, myth, coal train, my arch enemy, snow. I let it all go, my island, every island, I let them go. I traded in my loneliness for solitude and embraced the difference between the two. I learned like a poet must to live in the gap between the two and so I do, flickering between loneliness and solitude, Antiguan and New Yorker, Philip and Phillips, more neither than both because being both feels so utterly modern and naive. I talk to nothing. I wait for nothing to talk back. All you see me talking to the wind so you think I'm mad. Well, Shabin has bridled the horses of the sea. You see me watching the sun till my eyeball seared, so all you mad people feel Shabin crazy. But all you ain't know my strength here. The coconuts standing by in their regiments in yellow khaki, they waiting for Shabin to take over these islands. And all you best dread the day I am healed of being human. All you fate in my hand, ministers, businessmen, Shabin have you, friend. I shall scatter your lives like a handful of sand. I, who have no weapon but poetry, and the lances of the palms, and the sea's shining shield. Thank you very much.